Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Odoropa Smell Culture Fair. My name is Sophia Colette Eric, Olfactory Event Coordinator and Researcher on the Odoropa Project. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Trippin House today on behalf of the entire Odoropa team. I think I can speak for all of us when I say it is truly an honor to be amongst such talented and knowledgeable individuals today, and we continue to be astounded by the dedication, enthusiasm, and encouragement that we receive from this community. Thank you so much to each and every one of you for your unwavering support and keen interest and excitement for our project. It is now my pleasure to welcome the Netherlands Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences Director General, Zakia Guarnina, to the stage. Thank you, Sophia. Am I? Yeah, that's a picture of me. A picture without smells for now. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia, for your kind introduction. And dear guests and lovers of the old factory arts, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you today in the Odoropa Smells Culture Fair, organized by the Odoropa Project and hosted by the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science, abbreviated in Dutch to KNAW. I'm happy to see so many enthusiastic gathered here today to explore the rich world of old factory heritage and smell cultural research and development. Our world today is often dominated by what we see and what we hear. While smells also shape our experiences of the world, much more than any other sense, Smell is linked directly to our emotions, which you will see and hear about today. Um, emotions that can transport us into different moments, different times, and even different locations. I, for instance, personally, if I smell Moroccan couscous, I transport it into time back about 40, 50 years ago, into Marrakesh, sitting at the table of my grandmother, enjoying couscous in an Arabic uh, atmosphere, while I'm here in the Netherlands. Um, so the moment that you catch the familiar scent, it's like a time machine. You're transported into a different location, in different emotions, in different spheres. Yet we have so little sensory information about the past. When we're reading our favorite book, or when we're looking at works of art of the past, we try to mentally immerse ourselves in what happened um, in those moments, while the surroundings, the sounds, and of course smells are one of the most important things that can bring us there. So who among us have not dreamt of exploring old factory landscapes of the past, or try to hold legendary fragrances that haven't been preserved until today. This will become the reality thanks to the Odorepa project. With its mission to rediscover sense that time have, may have forgotten, this U European project have bundled expertise of history, arts of history, computational linguistics, semantic web, computer vision, heritage science, and chemistry. So it's a beautiful bundle of all kinds of disciplines. The most transdisciplinary you can find in my, uh, in my thinking. Over the past few years, they have come together to unravel the role of smell in shaping our cultural identity and they documented the smells of Europe as part of our cultural heritage. It's like a journey back in time, just like the journey I told you about for me personally. An attempt to capture the essence of sense that may have faded away. We as KNAW are very proud to support initiatives that push the boundaries of traditional understanding and foster collaboration across disciplines and borders. Odoropa's project 
and Smell Culture Fair exemplifies this spirit, bringing together scientists, artists, enthusiastics to explore the diverse facets of smell and its role in shaping our cultural identity. So for today, I hope you explore the exhibits and engage in discussion. And, and I encourage you to approach the experience with an open mind and an open emotion and keen to sense the curiosity and the fragrance you will encounter today. They are not just key sense of Europe, they carry stories and emotions, and I hope you experience those stories and emotions. I hope this event gets you all talking, feeling inspired, and really understanding of an exceptional collective of smells in history, which is gathered by this project. On behalf of KNW, I would like to thank the organizers, one of them sitting up here, for, uh, and the contributors, and each one of you that, for diving into the smell of cultural adventure today. Enjoy the journey and let the smell cultural affair begin today. Have a nice day. Thank you, Zakia, for the fine welcome. Uh, before we start, I will provide a brief overview of our plenary session, which will end today around 11. Um, the plenary session is separated into two parts. The first part is led by Inger Lehmanns, Oderopa's principal investigator, who will focus on Oderopa and its outcomes. And then she will invite Bernardo Fleming and Isabel Chazot to talk about the sense created within our project and how they will live on. The second part of the session is a panel discussion led by my colleague Cecilia Bembibre, who will invite four individuals to give, a brief, give brief statements on their research and participate in a panel discussion. Before I give the stage to Inger Lehmanns, a few words of housekeeping. Firstly, to respect those on stage and those in the audience, please silence your phones and refrain from using your phone throughout the session to keep distractions to a minimum. Secondly, some of our speakers will present sense with their presentations. So if you are seated in an aisle seat, please keep your nose and your eyes open for blotters. A stack will be handed to you and uh, please take one and pass it towards the middle of the row. Uh, without further ado, it is a pleasure to welcome Inger Lehmanns to the stage. I think I can be heard like this, right? Can you hear me from uh, the back as well? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Sophia, and um, thank you, uh, uh, Zakia, for that fantastic uh, introduction and welcoming us uh, to the beautiful uh, Trippe House. And I already immediately apologize uh, for us. Uh, me me <laughs> sorry messing with the smellscape of the, of the Trippe House uh, today. You already may be engaged with the sand station in the uh, main uh, entrance uh, of, the, of the Trippe House, where we chose not to uh, present the smell of paints and wooden frames, because the Trippe House actually was the ancestor of the Rijksmuseum, and the night watch uh, was hanging here in what is now called the Rembrandt Room. No, we chose gunpowder as a smell because the brothers Trip who founded this beautiful mansion uh, gained their wealth in weapons, uh, um, in, uh, the, in uh, the weapons uh, trade. So that's maybe already a mini example of what you can do with olfactory storytelling to think about the different historical layers of such a beautiful monument as uh, this. And again, I want to um, um, welcome you on behalf of the Oderopa project. We're really, really excited to see so many people here in the room. We're honored to have olfactory artists and perfumers who probably worked on smell their whole lives already and invested a lot in that. Uh, in that. We have scientists and scholars who maybe just like I sort of stumbled upon the uh, topic of smell during their uh, careers. We have people from the museum world, from heritage uh, institutions who tried out olfactory storytelling, but also maybe want to explore 
uh, what that could do with their uh, institute. And I think together, I can name you all, I hope you will all get to know each other during this day, which is really also meant as a matchmaking uh, event. Uh, together, I think we embody different leaves of a flower that may be uh, blossoming uh, since the sensory turn, especially uh, in the 1990s, uh, and where, where a growing interest for smell as a topic uh, can be visioned not only in the uh, sciences, but in many different realms of uh, expertise. Now, a lot of that research, you might say, goes into either chemical uh, analysis of uh, mapping the world of odors, and a lot of it is about what happens when a smell gets into the nose and then reaches the brain. So there's a lot of uh, research here and uh, there, but maybe uh, what we'll do, deal with today, uh, and which also has been the uh, topic of the Europa project, is smell as a cultural phenomenon. What happens when we experience smell? What kind of values do we attach to it? Uh, how do we deal with the materiality of smell? How do we name them? Uh, how can we uh, relate to the values that smell have brought from us uh, from the past. So this is a growing field. You can say we already see different kinds of discipline formation in the field with a growing amount of networks and conferences, journals dedicated to sensory uh, research, institutes that host fabulous podcasts and, and events. These are just a few examples, so I already apologize if your uh, initiative is not on this slide. Please explore further from here, I would say. It's just as an example to see how many different groups are interacting in the world of smell. Now, uh, an, another strand of this interest we have seen growing over the last uh, decades. Already for a longer time, museums and heritage institutes have become interested in uh, inviting olfactory artists to curate uh, exhibitions, for instance, but also to work with smell, for instance, in historical museums, to think about different ways of communicating between the artworks and uh, the uh, visitors. And this slide just gives a couple of the examples of um, uh, GLAMs, galleries, libraries, uh, archives, and museums who have done olfactory events in the last two years since the Europa project uh, started. Not to say that we were uh, in any way the actors of that. Um, for now, I want to just briefly talk a bit about our project because I'm so proud of it. And, <laughs> uh, and also, uh, it's what it brought us uh, together uh, uh, in this beautiful uh, day. The Odoropa project really uh, is focused on olfactory heritage, on smell as a cultural uh, phenomenon. And it does so by uh, combining a lot of uh, different expertise. And Sakia already uh, mapped them out uh, for you. Um, actually, the aim of the project uh, was um, connected to a call by the European Union. Uh, they called out f uh, on uh, how can we improve the impact of the heritage collections, and then specifically the digital heritage collections, that museums and libraries they have, and archives have invested so much in digitizing their collections, but how can we make those collections more tangible? And the Oda Ropa project said, well, why don't we think about smell and build so, sort of an olfactory layer or gateway into those uh, digital collections? And that's what we've been doing in the last three years. And I'll just briefly run over some of the uh, things our teams have been developing. So we have an image recognition. Our German team has trained models, computer models, to capture, to recognize <clears throat> uh, olfactory objects, think about uh, flowers or carriers of uh, odors such as incense burners in paintings and prints and all kinds of images. But also my favorite olfactory gestures like people pinching the nose or smelling something uh, and fragrant spaces. So uh, we have a whole overview of that now. Then our text mining uh, team has worked very, very hard uh, from Italy and from the Canada Bay to <coughs> capture smell moments 
in text from those witnesses of the past. And we mainly focus on the period between 1600 and the beginning of the 20th century here, because we have a wealth of data, and also it's a very interesting period to research. And they were able to capture smell, uh, events, perceivers, qualities of smells described, sentiments described from seven different languages. And then our uh, brilliant semantic web team built the Odoropa uh, data model to gather all that information into one uh, system. And here I really uh, want to stress uh, how much we invested in the Odoropa project to bring together into conversation constantly all those different voices from the sciences, from the humanities, social sciences, but also from experts, from uh, the perfumers that we uh, work with. So making sure that the questions that we had in the end could be answered by all the digital developments that we uh, made. And this has resulted in a lot of different uh, um, assets, you might call them. And today you can uh, explore them. And we're really looking back, uh, forward also to your feedback, because we still have a couple of weeks to improve uh, what we've been doing. Um, this is the beautiful Odoropa ontology. I will leave the explanation uh, of it to uh, uh, Rafael Tronsi and his team in the data session today. Um, what we did is uh, create a website where you can easily reach all the textual and image data, the Odoropa Smell Explorer. Connected to that, behind that Smell Explorer, is not a gold mine, but maybe a sense organ of olfactory data. So if you are more data driven, then you can reach all uh, our data because it's open uh, access uh, for you. Not all of us probably are um, so data savvy. So what we also did, uh, led by uh, William Tullets, a team of historians, is curate an encyclopedia of smell, history, and heritage. And we really see this as a growing encyclopedia. It's full of entry storylines where you can sort of start to explore the world of smell and smell heritage. And if you think, oh, man, now I'm an expert on this or that sand, then please contact William and see whether you can integrate our, your knowledge into our encyclopedia so we can build that to the future. Another strength of the Odoropa project is researching smell smells in their materiality. And here Cecilia ben uh, team has worked a lot on heritage science uh, uh, technologies to capture and also to create a model for documenting smells. And in a lot of these instances, we needed to sort of start from, uh, from scratch and take really the first steps on how to capture historical smells so that in the end we can preserve them, but also to represent them to the uh, public nose. And for this, we created uh, a, a model, a methodology, different methodologies, I think, for scent uh, reconstructions and uh, recreations. And we're very happy that uh, in just two, one minute, we're going to tell more about these reconstructions and recreations. What we did. Um, is by, led by the uh, uh, olfactory event team, uh, Sophia uh, Erich uh, uh, coordinated, is to then uh, organize different olfactory events, workshops, uh, tours through museums. Uh, we have a city sniffers tours that you can still uh, capture. We still have the scratch and sniff cards uh, available for you in the foyer uh, later. Not only to present our scent recreations to the world, but also to capture what it is that happens when smells are reintroduced into <coughs> a heritage context. So Cecilia's team has measured the impact of olfactory storytelling uh, for us. All that information about how to work with smells in a museum context is curated in the olfactory storytelling toolkit. And today you can engage with that toolkit and be trained to, on how to use it and how to navigate between the different uh, components. Um, but uh, 
first, let's talk a bit more about the sense creations and uh, reconstructions that we made. And I'm really, really happy that uh, for this, I can welcome Bernardo Fleming from IFF to the uh, floor. Bernardo, the stage is up. Uh, is... Thank you, thank you, and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, see, my name is Bernardo Fleming. I'm part of IFF. And I'm a, I had the privilege and the honor to be part of this, uh, of this uh, work, uh, this project, uh, leading the development of the beautiful historical scent collection that you will receive. This is a, a, a collection where we, tend, we will bring this amazing uh, body of knowledge into a uh, sense, so bringing that, and also being part of the development of the different and the works that uh, Ode Europa has been doing over the last years, and really bringing the scent dimension into that work. <clears throat> being uh, Working as a bridge between the researchers, being part of the consortium of Ode Europa, and the fragrance industry. As mentioned, I'm part of IFF, a fragrance house, uh, and my, my role was very much bringing that expertise, that wisdom that the team had into the creative teams, putting, uh, giving access to not only the, the, the expertise, the infrastructure, but also the talent, the passion, and the creativity of our perfumers, our artists, who had the, 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 the job of really bringing that scent layer into the glam. This is the, the toolkit, and I think here we have people from very different backgrounds, different uh, uh, areas of expertise, and I think the beauty about this project was very much combining all those elements and making this into a collection that hopefully is the beginning of much more to come. People from different backgrounds probably will hopefully agree that uh, scent has a superpower, okay? Scent has the superpower to awaken our extraordinary senses. And when I'm talking about the extraordinary senses, we're talking about the extraordinary senses of fascination, the extraordinary sense of, of awe, of surprise, of discovery. And personally, it has awakened two very important uh, uh, superpowers. One is the sense of, extraordinary sense of pride. I think uh, Inger was mentioned before, the, the sense of pride of the accomplishment, not only on the, on, the, on the outcome of this project, the kit, which is very much a smelly fruit of this tree of wisdom that we've been building and continues to build, but also about the learnings. It's about the capturing all this knowledge that was disseminated in pockets and really bring them together in a way that this will transcend uh, the work that we've been doing and hopefully will continue happening. But let's not talk about scent. I think it's very important also that we smell, okay? We are talking about the power of smell. So I think it's very important that we smell and we will be passing around some blotters with the, uh, one of the creations for, uh, that's going to go, that is in the kit. Uh, I'm a spoiler, it's not a spoiler, it's actually a warning. <laughs> part of the exercise and part of the main challenges that we had when briefing the perfumers is that the perfumers are trained and uh, they, they, they develop their skill to create beautiful things that people love. In this case, it's not always the case, okay? So what we will be smelling is the scent created for this beautiful painting from uh, Jan, uh, let me correct that, that my Dutch is terrible, uh, but you are talking about Jan uh, van der Heyden, okay? This artist took the city escape and he painted very much what was a typical uh, scene in Amsterdam, actually 200 meters away from here. If you visit that space today, it will look from an architectural point of view very similar now. Probably what smells is radically different today than it was in the 16th century. So the recreation and the work that was done by the perfumer was very much capturing all these different elements, those kind of nuggets, those insights that were used as a creative brief, where you will smell probably something very stinky. Yeah, I can see those reactions. And that very much is what was this, the canals were smelling. They look beautiful, but they had you can see the latrines. There was no sewage system, so everything will go to the canals. The heat, the water's not moving, the stagnant heat. So also you can smell the mossiness, the wetness, the dampness of the wood that from the bridge. So very much the work was to take all these elements, those visual elements, and translate them into an olfactive brief. Also applying technologies, unique technologies and capabilities, we have the smell of damp horse, okay, the sweaty horse. Okay, so that's probably what we're capturing there, okay? We're talking about 
feces, okay, because that was going into the canals. So very much what we, are, what we recreated in this case, what was the smell of the canals in the 16th century, because this, if it wasn't this way, it would be lost. Like this, you will find 12 creations from the outcome of this uh, project. Uh, there are much more, and this will go will be part of the heritage uh, smell library that Isabel will be presenting. And hopefully this is another step toward uh, uh, more of this. Last but not least, the extraordinary sense of uh, excitement. And I think personally, I'm super excited to see a lot of familiar faces, but also a lot of new faces. We're multiplying our noses, and hopefully these noses are pointing into the direction of the glam, where we can expand and do much more, bringing the same dimension into this sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bernardo, and you just briefly held it up, but I'm going to do this once again, because this beautiful smell box, and really it sort of opens, <laughs> but it came in yesterday, it was like piles, kilos and kilos of fragrances, and you already can smell it a bit, and there's a beautiful booklet, uh, which has been curated by many different, by the perfumers, by uh, the, the uh, uh, historical groups, into stories around the scents, like the canal uh, scent. And uh, later today, uh, at the end of the smell fair, when you're handing in your badge, uh, if you um, um, want to make use of this smell kit, you can uh, obtain uh, one. Please do not store it uh, just on your shelf, but use it for further uh, uh, communication and projects uh, so we can spread the news from there. Thank you so much, uh, Benano. Uh, also for building this collection uh, with us. Um, but yeah, building a collection and, and creating this beautiful smell kit is uh, maybe one thing, but how can we make sure that these scents are then preserved for even a uh, longer time? So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Isabel Chazot to, uh, to the stage uh, because she has some great news to tell us about that. Thank you very much, Inger. Good morning to all. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And um, I would like to thank Inger, Cecilia, and Sofia for the invitation to participate to this plenary session. Bernardo uh, Fleming has described the content of the Odorapa Historical Smell collection, and I'm going to describe why it is interesting and important for the Osmotech to house and safeguard this collection into the Heritage Smell Library. But in, our, in order for you to understand, you need some more elements about the Osmotech's missions and the way it works. So um, the Osmotech, um, for many of you, is already familiar. Is, uh, it's a unique place in the world. It's uh, the heritage of perfumery, the only perfume archive in the world. It operates as an independent, not-profit organization dedicated, dedicated to the olfactory cultural heritage. And it's, very importantly, for the benefit of all. Historically, it started with perfumers wanting to protect fragrances, mainly dating from the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And, but it has uh, opened to uh, new sections. Today, the Osmotech houses a collection of 5,500 perfumes. 850 have disappeared from the markets, and 400 are in their original edition. We all also house uh, hundreds of formulas and hundreds of disappeared raw materials in order to be able to re -weigh, recreate those perfumes. <clears throat> in the Osmotech, we maintain our collection under uh, met, uh, meticulously optimized con uh, conditions because our first mission is the preservation. So you can see on the slide, there's um, a, what we call the cellar with a lot of uh, fridges. 
uh, that keep the, um, the fragrances away from their usual enemies, which are light, heat, and oxygen. And this collection enables, enables us to present the heritage to many different audiences, because the Osmotech's second mission is transmission. So through olfactory conferences, we, uh, with a lot of perfumes, we can introduce the perfumery heritage to different types of audiences, professionals, students, general public, perfume lovers, researchers. And uh, the Osmotech third mission is to work actually with res researchers. The Osmotech has embarked on a thoughtful examination of its methodologies, particularly the delicate process of perfume reweighing, which is our main method. This introspection also includes exploring alternative approaches to interacting with the sense of the past through historical reconstitutions. And it's within this framework that we are delighted to unveil a new section dedicated to the heritage Small library. On this slide, you can see uh, Jean Carreau, the founder of the Osmotech, uh, reweighing a perfume. So, um, the, among our many topics of research, the scientific committee has set out to classify the different methods of reconstituting the sense of the past. And you can see here uh, one of the results, which is reposé, reweighing the way. Um, uh, that is mostly used uh, by the Osmotech, the adaptations, reconstructions, interpretations, and evocations. In the collection, we have already different types of perfumes and scents. And today, we are very happy to welcome a specific section for the Heritage Smell Library. So this uh, library, um, is made of 18 smells and scents, and we uh, welcome it to the Osmotech as a whole, the result of the hard work of the Odoropass project for uh, three years. The scents are kept in bottles with the Odoropa label, as you can see here, and it's very important that every single scent is accompanied by precise documentation describing its cultural interest and the, me the method used for its reconstitution. So to conclude, the Osmotech is a living archive constantly evolving to enrich the olfactory heritage. The launch of this new section is a living proof, symbolizing our commitment to preservation and transmission. We are deeply honored by your trust in the Osmotech's role as a guardian of your work. We will curate and present this collection to current enthusiasts and future generations, ensuring that the legacy of our shared olfactory history endures. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. Oh, I'm going back for a sec. Oop. Um, for, and yeah, we're so, uh, proud and happy that uh, the Osmotech is uh, going to host uh, this uh, start of the Smell Heritage uh, uh, Library because like the encyclopedia, we really see this as a start and we hope that this library will grow in the future with new applications for heritage uh, smells. Uh, now, there is another issue. Uh, we might preserve the materiality of uh, the sense, but how can we make sure that we safeguard the digital information that we captured? And I'm going to just stretch my uh, time a little bit to give Raphael Trancy uh, the word for one minute to uh, announce yet another exciting uh, new addition to the uh, Odoropa. Uh, development. Uh, Raphael, floor is yours. Um, thanks a lot, Inger. So it's it's a collaboration actually with the European project named Oligo Archive, which uh, has been funded by the European Commission. It is now following up by a number of a number of other projects, and they have this crazy idea of storing digital information in DNA. Uh, so what we have done is that we have selected a, a particular scent, the frankincense scent 
and a number of um, documents that describe this scent, including its odor descriptors, uh, excerpts uh, of text that talk about this scent, as well as uh, artworks, uh, of course, of vocabularies or knowledge graph or ontology, and also this uh, scholar article, Smell of Heritage, that have been uh, published uh, in Heritage Science uh, by uh, Cecilia Bembibre and, and other co-authors. And uh, this digital information have been simply, um, instead of being encoded into zero and one bytes, here it's, it's very computer science and nerdy stuff, it has been encoded into four letters, the four letters of the DNA, the A, C, G, and T. And those strings, have been uh, then synthesized in synthetic DNA. And now we have capsules that look like this, but are very tiny, that contains this information preserved forever that we can decode even with errors and recover from the errors. And uh, because this is now synthetic DNA, we believe that, like for mammoth, we can preserve that for uh, eternity. Wow. <laughs> I was looking forward to see it, but uh, uh, that, that will remain a mystery for later then. Uh, yeah, that's, this is just uh, me closing off this uh, uh, first part of the plenary uh, uh, session by um, um, stating that had the Oderopa uh, project, I think, has, has tried to capture what it is that we can do with uh, smells. And um, uh, one of the... One of the um, Methodologies that we also followed is uh, interviewing people, capturing their responses to, for instance, the olfactory ev events that we hosted and what we f uh, found, and Cecilia Benbiner's team has uh, captured this, is that um, uh, actually people um, see a lot of value in engaging more with smells. And those values can be about communication, about legacy, about opening up to other people, about being more active in a museum, but, and the wow that, that Bernardo was talking about, but also about gaining knowledge. Not only historical sensations, but also really gaining knowledge from uh, making use of your uh, nose. So that's just a major call out for everyone to uh, engage in this uh, world. And for this, I want to close off by thanking everyone who helped us uh, develop uh, what we did until now, specifically the advisory uh, board. Uh, some of them uh, are uh, advisory board members you will engage now with in the round table or later during the exhibits and uh, sessions. Thank you very much, and I'll gladly give the floor back to uh, Sophia. So now that you've heard all about the Odoropa project, um, we'll open the second part of our plenary session, which will we will welcome um, some of the advisory board members, but also some other uh, researchers to the floor. Um, and uh, this uh, panel, we'll have a panel discussion as well, which will be led by my colleague, Cecilia Bembibre. So I welcome Cecilia to the stage. Thank you, Sophia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll introduce myself. I have led, or I'm still leading, because the project hasn't finished, the tasks related to olfactory heritage science. My name is Cecilia Benvivre, and I'm a lecturer in sustainable heritage at UCL. It is my pleasure now to introduce the next four speakers. Um, each of them has engaged with the sense of smell in their own way, in their work, and by doing so has inspired us and inspired others. So today we have asked them to give a brief statement about their work and then in, engage in a conversation where we talk about how the knowledge created in the Europa project can have an impact in different fields and in society in general. Um, we'll also talk about the future. What does the future hold for smell studies and its impact on society? So the first speaker is Alison Heritage. She's a project manager and works in the strategic 
Planning Unit at ICROM, where she serves as a focal point for research for the organization, also overseeing ICROM's fellowship program. A priority focus within her work is the promotion of collaborative practices in heritage research to enhance its relevance and impact for diverse communities of interest. Through her involvement in broad international community-based initiatives, she works to support capacity building and the identification of strategic priorities so that heritage research is better able to respond to current and future sector needs. Our second speaker will be Gregorio Solavera. Gregorio Solavera is the senior perfumer and creative director at Puch, Spanish perfumery firm. He's also a member of the Spanish Academy of Perfume. Passionate for perfumes since his childhood, he believes that perfumes make a great impact on everyone's life and that they are not only memories but also feelings. Gregorio was instrumental to the creation of the sense for the exhibition The Essence of a Painting, an olfactory exhibition at the Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain. He'll be followed by Asfa Majid. Asfa is a professor of cognitive science at the University of Oxford and fellow of St. Hughes College. Asfa spent many years in the Netherlands, first at the Mask, Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics and then at Rabud University before leaving for the University of York and then Harvard University. She has been awarded various prizes for her work which straddles the boundaries of psychology, linguistics and anthropology and is an elected fellow of the Cognitive Science Society, Association for Psycholo Psychological Science and Academia Europea. And finally, we'll hear from Simon Niedenthal. Simon is a professor of interaction design at Malmo University in Sweden. Simon uses game studies framework and user-centered methodologies to study olfaction, the sense of smell, of course, in interactive contexts, with the aims of contributing to new applications of the educational, rehabilitative, and playful uses of scent. Simon's educational background is eclectic. He holds a BFA in photography, an MA in medieval English literature, and a PhD in interaction design. In 2008, he defended his PhD thesis, Complicated Shadows, the aesthetic significance of si simulating illumination in digital games. In the area of game lighting and its effect upon the emotions and behaviors of the player. Since 2010, he has employed his multidisciplinary background to explore the history and potentials of smell-enabled gaming and the playful uses of scent. So we'll welcome Alison, please. Where are you, Alison? Oh, there you are. No, 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 no. I just have a few words. Very simple. Keep it simple. Hi. <laughs> right. Sorry? I think I forgot the, to move the slides. Oh, yeah. Is I am so sorry. Okay, go, go. You, you, uh, you do your bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's me. There we go. You don't need to see me out there. Um, right, hello. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cecilia, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, Thank you so much for the invitation. And, and really, thank you so much for um, allowing me to be uh, connected to this research project through the the advisory board. It really has been an honour and a privilege. And in a way, I feel I have a small, com well, a confession to make right at the very beginning to say I'm, I'm not an olfactory expert. Um, I do, however, work within heritage research. And so I really want to talk a little bit more about where I see this connecting um, on some quite significant and fundamental levels. So, so forgive me that I'm not an expert, but um, I hope I can set it into 
uh, a broader context. Um, I've worked in cultural heritage for over 30 years. I know it doesn't look like it. Uh, we're all young <laughs> at heart. Um, as both a conservator and a scientist. And I now work for ECROM, the International Centre for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. It's a long one. Um, I always take a deep breath before I launch into the name of our organisation. Um, which may be known to many of you, but just for those who don't know ECROM, we're an intergovernmental organisation. In fact, the only one of its kind in the world. Um, which for over 60 years has been working in the service of its 137 member states to promote the conservation of all types of heritage. Now, that has always been our mantra, all types of heritage. And yet, to date, for ECROM, olfactory heritage has not featured significantly within our work, which I think is quite, um, uh, you know, in view of this research, it is quite an astonishing reflection, really. And I would say there are generally acknowledged to be three stages in the communication of new ideas. Awareness, knowing about it, acceptance, recognizing that this knowledge is valid and important and that we actually need to do something about it. And then finally, adoption, which means actually incorporating it into practice. So the three A's, right? And I would say here, we're at the level of awareness, yeah? And in many ways, this might be the easy part. Smell is something that we engage with readily. Uh, we all have an innate sense of the significance of what it means for us, and we've heard about that from, from our previous speakers, as we've all experienced it. Um, but for many of us, we rarely pay attention to it. Um, it forms a part of our sense of self, our connection also with our former selves, our notion of being in the world. But the issue here is how to move on to acceptance and adoption. And acceptance, I think, can certainly be facilitated through the support and endorsement of recognized institutions such as ECROM. For example, when I received the policy paper shared by Cecilia. I'd, I'd shared this, of course, with my ECROM colleagues, and the response I got back was universal interest. Wow, this is fascinating. I even got comments like, I'm so jealous. I wish I was uh, going to Amsterdam with you and part of this conversation. But amongst that enthusiasm, the question coming back was, what do we do about this? And I think that's probably the key thing. Certainly reaching out to organizations such as ECROM, ECOMOS, ICOM, UNESCO, which I know you have been doing. And in particular, given that this is a European project, the European Commission, Council of Europe will be key. Um, however, adoption really is the hardest part. And I think the tools that have been provided through the project um, are absolutely essential in providing opportunities uh, for expanding their use, um, particularly through education and research, providing training and new insights. At the moment, their focus is very much European. They obviously need to be expanded to other regions and countries. And it's through the three A's that we finally get through to policy making and practice. And my hope is that in the future, olfactory heritage will be more recognized within heritage practice at local, national, and international level and who knows, maybe even inscribed in World Heritage Lists. But just a final comment on why is this important, and this is really the big connection point. We live in a world that's rapidly changing, and smell is an additional way to connect with ourselves, our notion of being in the world. And this is relevant now, when we're dealing with very rapid and unsettling change. In a world that's speeding up, we need to slow down. We need to reconnect with ourselves, with each other. And many of us feel that there's something missing in the way we exist in the world at this moment. There's a widely held sense that we're facing a crisis of existence, not just existential threat, but of existing in the world. We need, in some ways, to take breath. 
And so I think providing additional ways in which to do this is vital. And a multi-sensory approach to heritage is very much in line with more holistic approaches that are being taken in other sectors, health, the environment, for example and recognizing the importance of heritage as a foundation of well, our well-being. And so I think really with regards to adoption, a key route through might be presenting olfactory not, heritage not as an additional thing on the to-do list of organizations to take care of, but rather connecting it to the more pressing and wider issues of our, pressing issues of our time, such as well-being and mental health. So presenting, engaging with scent within heritage as an additional means, a creative, playful means of addressing wider objectives with the goal of embedding it within wider policy as a tool for well-being. Thank you. So they are passing you a, a new blower with the amber glove that had been shown in the uh, Prado Museum. Uh, for me, I felt the luckiest person when I did this project uh, because I'm used to work in the future. Uh, as a perfumer for Putsch, I'm working today in 2025-2026. So we, we go ahead, we do not work with fashion, we work with trends. And suddenly this project arrived to me and I felt the luckiest person because I have to dig deep dive in the, in the history of the perfumery. One of the most difficult things when you dive uh, inside the perfume is uh, that there is no book, there is no history. We as a perfumer, we hide with uh, our formula and we only transfer to our son or to our daughter. The perfume that you are smelling, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of time. Everyone got? I wait a little, like that you have time enough to smell. This perfume belongs to me, but also to Simone Labarbe. Simone Labarbe was the perfumer of Louis XIV, uh, King of France. And this perfume contained in one hand, in one hand the the smell of the gloves, the leather, the skin of a cake, because it has a very uh, sweet and very uh, velvety skin. And on the other hand, you have the formula uh, of the perfume, with, which you will, will, with, will wet sorry, the skin. So you have the two sides. Then you can smell the, the leather, and then you can smell the perfume. To find the perfect balance was very difficult because if to, you add so much uh, leather, then you only smell the glove. If you add so much perfume, then you do not smell the glove. And we try to balance the perfume to have the two sides of the perfume. So this perfume belonged to Simone Lavarf as his original part, but the one from the glove was mine, so it's a mix between him and, and me. I hope you like it. This one was one of the most successful uh, smell in the Prado Museum exhibit. Uh, we developed 10 perfume for a, for a painting from Jan Bruegel. And uh, we choose uh, amber glove because Ruben, who was also one of the painters of this painting, was also an ambassador from the King of Spain. And when he came, uh, to the, to, to the um, at that time was the Spanish territory, Holland. So when he came here, he bring as a gift uh, two pairs of uh, amber gloves for the, for the queen. And then the curator of the Prado asked me at that moment, will you find this, uh, uh, this perfume? So I was finding in a lot of books, uh, I was searching to find the formula and finally, I fell on the formula from uh, Simon Labar, and then we tried to reproduce. It was not easy because some of the ingredients that they use in the past, you cannot use today. So you have to work with some different ingredient to match the same smell. But for me, it was uh, one of the most amazing projects in my life. So uh, the Prado Museum is still alive. You can smell this amber glove in the 
in the Prado Museum today, if you go to Madrid and then you go into the, in the room uh, 56, you can find it a smell because it was the most pleased one and people loved them. And then we, we left them in the permanent collection. It's the first time that Prado Museum do something like that. In terms of how much has this influence in people, we were expecting to have just 100 people per day and finally, we got 1,000 people per day without any publicity, any advertisement, just people take to, a, to one to another that, you see, you can, you can smell the smell of a painting. It's amazing. And there's people and people smelling. And the most amazing thing is that they were sharing their smell. They were loathing. You know, Prado Museum is very quiet and calm, like museum, no? You, you, are in the smell, you are in the room and you cannot speak so, so loud. And people were loathing and sharing, and you see, and when they arrived to Cybet, oh, oh, it's horrible, horrible, and they were loathing. And it was the most amazing thing that you can share your smell, and then you can share your experience, because at the end, a perfume left a footprint in your life. The couscous maybe contains uh, cardamom or maybe contains cumin, so it's his own footprint for her. And for me, couscous will be another. So please try to smell and don't forget that it's more than a feeling, it's more than a souvenir, it's something that is in your life. So thank you very much. I was asked to reflect on what the Uderopa project uh, contributes um, to my field and my work. Um, and so it made me reflect on the fact that when I started working on olfaction, there was a background set of assumptions. Um, Howard Gardner, who's written about multiple intelligences, claimed that when it comes to keen gustatory or olfactory senses, these abilities have little special value across cultures. In linguistics, Franz Planck, um, a notable typologist, had claimed that a sizable inventory of basic smell terms are linguistic rarum. That means having more than two or three smell words in a language should not be found in the 7,000 languages that are spoken in the world. And Steve Pinker, the notable cognitive scientist, claimed in How the Mind Works, smell is vestigial in humans. So given this, it seemed that there's not much elaboration of smell. In, in my own uh, empirical research with English, we'd found if we looked across registers and genres um, of English uh, language materials, that visual talk dominated, but smell was very infrequent, if visible at all. And it didn't matter if you looked at academic work or spoken language, smell rarely featured in everyday language. And this seemed to be something that was relatively stable. So if you look from 2000 to the 1800s, you'll see that vision dominates language and that smell and taste are very infrequent and relatively stably infrequent. So it's not the case that this is something that happened in recent times. Now, it's not just English um, and it's not just language. So um, if we think about what our mental lives can hold for us, we can see there seems to be an asymmetry in what's possible in imagery. So we'll do a little task together if, we, if you want to. I, I don't have smells, but I do have um, other aids. So I want you to try and imagine seeing a sunset. Imagine it in your mind. Try to conjure the picture. Think about how vivid that image is from zero, I can't bring anything to mind, to five, it's as if I'm standing in front of a sunset right now. So you can hold up your fingers to let me know how strong your imagery is. Oh, somebody's got very strong imagery. Okay. Okay, now try to do the same again with imagine hearing an ambulance siren. Okay. Imagine touching a soft towel. Now imagine tasting lemon. Oh wow, you guys are special images. 
Okay, now imagine smelling newly cut grass. Now, this audience is the right one to ask this, but when we do this with a range of Dutch speakers, we again find that visual and auditory imagery is relatively strong, and smell imagery is relatively weak across people. And this seems to be something that's stable across ages. So as young as nine years of age, smell and taste imagery is weak. Now, all of this comes together to support these general conjectures that smell just isn't important in our mental life or in language. Um, but that was challenged, I think, in uh, my own field work with my colleague Nicholas Bernholt when we worked with the Jahai, who are a group of nomadic hunter-gatherers who live in the Malay Peninsula. And we found in this language there's a dozen smell terms. These are terms that are specific to odors. They're not used for taste. They're not used for vision. So it smells like latput, which refer to the smell of flowers and soap and durian. Junges, which are stinging sorts of smells um, associated with smoke, some species of centipedes, uh, the stem of wild ginger, bat caves. Hae, which are unpleasant sorts of smells associated with shrimp paste. Uh, tree sap, the smell of tiger, and so forth. And when we tested Jahai participants in their ability to name different smells delivered as scratch and sniff cards and colors, standardized colors, and compared them to English speakers, we found that while English speakers show high uh, agreement in how they talk about colors, they don't show any agreement in how they name smells. But for the Jahai, there was no difference in how they named colors and smells. Both were equally as easy for them. Now, um, that made us think about what's in culture that's supporting this. And we found that smell is important in hunting and gathering in this community, but also in medicinal practices, in their ritual and religion, in their material culture, in child rearing practices, and in their beliefs about the natural and supernatural. Since that work, which we started in 2011, we found that the Jahai are not the only ones that show more codability of smell than English. And in fact, in other languages, talk about smell is more frequent than what we find in English. And collating the information together in a review paper recently, we found smell language, large lexicons for smell, all over the world, with two notable exceptions. We don't seem to find this in Europe, and we don't seem to find this in Australia. Now, whether that's truly a gap, or the fact that we just haven't bothered to look is something that the Uderoba project now provokes us to reconsider. And I think it's important to think about this because in experimental work, we've shown that we can train people to learn smell categories when we give them consistent input in comparison to inconsistent input. So we give people words and smells and we pair them together in these different uh, contingencies. And what we find is that when we give them consistent language input, they're able to learn smell categories better than if we give them inconsistent language input. And we can do this just after four days of training. And on the fifth day, even when we don't give the language labels anymore, they've learned these smell categories. So overall, I'm really excited about what the Uderopa project delivers to the cognitive sciences, to psychology, linguistics, and anthropology, because it questions these assumptions that are in my field held across the board. And uh, looking forward to the rest of the day to see what we've learned. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. I'm Simon Niedenthal. I'm a professor of interaction design at Malmö University in Sweden. And I study olfaction, the sense of smell, in interactive and digital environments. And what I wanted to offer today was some playful reflections on Oderopa. I thought that's something I could offer to um, those of you who have been working with Oderopa over the last years. Um, as you start to wind down and reflect upon the significance of what you've learned. Um, this is, again, uh, Cecilia mentioned this, this is what I do as research. Um, I use game studies frameworks and user-centered design methodologies to study olfaction in interactive contexts. I tend to work quite a bit in interdisciplinary teams, and I really am interested in looking at new applications of the educational, rehabilitative, and playful uses of scent. 
So I do a lot, uh, spend a lot of time doing different kinds of hardware development. This is an olfactory display for virtual reality that I worked on with partners at Stockholm University working in sensory psychology. Um, and I, so I tend to reflect quite a bit on these challenges of how do we present smells in different kinds of mediated environments. And so I think about these really basic challenges that we have about smell presentation, how do we think about the challenge of actually getting smells out into the world and to people's noses. And so I've been really interested in, in following in, in Odoropa how these really basic challenges have been applied, looking at specific contexts like museums and thinking in really simple and effective ways about how people can experience scent in relation, in this case, to artwork, the WOD, as, um, as it's called. But I also want to talk a little bit about uh, games and play. And when I started looking at games, uh, digital games, I started looking at scent and smell in playful contexts about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. And when I started trying to get an overview of games that had a smell element, it was pretty clear that there weren't very many. It didn't take very long to get an overview of this area. And then if I wanted to say something significant about smell in playful contexts, I had to start to cast a broader net to look at a whole series of different kinds of, of, of play contexts and game contexts. And I had to also to cast a broader disciplinary net to start to read in, in media history and cultural history and literature and um, the psychophysiology of smell, all things that I had to start to learn about. And I started to you know, look at things like toys, physical smells, board games that had fragrant materials, uh, games taking place in real space with a smell ambiance, um, design discourses that have a, a game-like qualities like perfume, which actually is really interesting. It's about fantasy, taking on a role, make-believe, um, looking at the Japanese Kodo ceremony, which is also a, about incense appreciation, but it's also a game where you can do well or not. Uh, one of the things I started to look at, one of the, my first Odoropa moments was when I was looking at the book Aroma that many of you have probably read by Howes, uh, Clausen, and Sinnott, there is a, a passing mention to this idea of people throwing um, rose water scented eggshells at each other. And I kind of followed up on that. I thought it'd be, it was kind of an interesting idea. And it was playful. So I had this idea of trying to recreate a really basic play form. And I guess I was kind of trying to recreate this cultural form as well. But basically, I came across this mention from a, a banquet manual from the 17th century. And basically, it's just about how you can create the scented bombs of rose water for a, your next banquet, where people are, are drinking quite a bit and, and uh, having quite a bit of fun. And um, I was intrigued by this, because it was really about, um, it's gendered, which is interesting, but it's also about um, how smell could intervene playfully in a smell environment of noxious, uh, the smells of, of women's per, uh, cosmetics at this time, which are relatively noxious. So I basically created this. I blew. Uh, egg out, I replaced it with commercial rose water. Um, I sealed it with wax because that seemed plausible. I took it out in my garden and had my wife throw it at me very hard. <laughs> and, um, which was interesting to see how it, how, did it hurt? How, how, how strong was the smell? And so that was my first Odoropa moment. And what I wanted to offer as we consider the impact of Odoropa, Odoropa's done some great job with storytelling, but I'd like to also consider play, because play is not exactly the same. So we can think about play as something that's contextual, that takes place in places and with people, networks of people, places, and things. It's carnivalesque. It can be about reversing existing social or institutional hierarchies. It can be appropriative about taking over a place or taking over the function of objects, disruptive, autotelic, meaning it's something we do for its own sake, not for external reward, creative and personal. And as we wrap up Odoropa, let's think about this a little bit as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Thank you all for your very fascinating reflections of how the project can have an impact. The knowledge we developed 
uh, in the project can have an impact on each of your fields. I was thinking about the common threads in your presentations or statements. And one of them that I would like to ask you a little bit about was education. It came up in different ways. So Alison, you, you talk about the three stages. Um, and I wonder how do we go from awareness to adoption with education? Gregorio, you, you as a perfumer, of course, you received a very particular smell education. And I wonder what do we have to learn uh, in our own fields to develop our, our sense of smell and the way we engage with it. I will go with Asfa next. <laughs> um, because I, I also wonder, there was a mention here that the way we have spoken about smell is very Eurocentric until now. And I wonder what do we have to learn from the rest of the world, from other cultures? And Simon, <laughs> very interestingly, what shape this education, smell education can take, and perhaps it is taking, uh, throwing scented eggs at each other. So I was wondering if each of you could give us a, a brief uh, reflection on how we ensure that the attention, the awareness, the interest in the museums, the playfulness, or the momentarily um, center in each of our fields is supported towards the future. Yeah. Do, do you want me to go first? Yes. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, how to say, speaking from the perspective of Ecrom, we're, we're very much a training organisation. Um, but our focus is more on, is, is on mid-career heritage professionals. So I think it's more about training people in order to be able to use and also educate mm -hmm. through smell. Um, but of course we have to educate ourselves. Exactly, first. because in, in heritage, in many yes. Uh, yes aspects of the heritage sector, smell is seen as something that we have to get rid of, right? Because yeah. it's a threat to our material heritage, at least. Yeah, so yeah. perhaps the first thing is to deseducate ourselves yeah, or exactly. start thinking. Or, yeah, re-educate, re reconnect. Re-educate, yes. Sorry, and I was, I was just so taken by, by all of your statements, um, particularly with this notion of play as a way of exploring that. I don't think we do that enough, actually. In, we're terribly formal in heritage training. I think play is a key um, dimension that we can, that a tool that we can use. And in fact, actually, in, at ECROM, we, we do use play a lot because our courses are always um, multidisciplinary and international. So you have to find these ways to connect people. And I'm also thinking that actually it could even be uh, a very useful tool just for creating that initial connection and, you know, the group, because it's also very much about learning from each other. But, but smell is something that we haven't explored, and I think we certainly should be. And thinking about Asifa's comments as well, I'm just thinking what a wonderful medium also just to be discovering so much, you know, to, to apply that then to other areas. You're providing people with tools not just about heritage, but about the world around. Okay, thank you. Um, well, for me, it's very important to to blend with other uh, discipline. You know, in, in the perfumery school, the first thing they teach you is the vocabulary. So we speak like musician, notes, accord, composition, because we don't have any words, as you say, there is no word. I remember teaching my daughter what a rose is, and I say, velvety, what is velvety? She was three years old, what is velvety? She doesn't know. It's impossible. So one of the problems that we have is that we do not have vocabulary. For, for sight, it's easy because you see. For hearing, then you realize music. And they teach you music at the school, but they don't teach you any note of smell at the school. So I think we have to start from the beginning and it's at the school, but blending with other discipline. I see master chef that is very famous all around, and when they cook, they don't say a word about 
what they are adding and why. So when you add spices, when you are, uh, when you add peppermint or spearmint, or when you are adding some flavors at the end, it's a smell. So I think that we we have to collaborate with other disciplines that are very spread around the world, like kitchen, you know, with the chef, and tell, uh, pick up his vocabulary, and then say to people because a lot of time when when people arrive to me, I say, Anna, I don't have, I don't know anything about perfumery, and I say, but you know citrus, yes, which is one the one most uh, acid one. A grapefruit, and the sweetest one, mandarin, and then the other is lemon. It's less it's less acid than pump, that grapefruit, but more uh, more acid than orange. Then you already have a classification. You already know, but no one teach you, and no one know tell you how to place the different smell that you already know. Uh, in Spain, uh, twenty years ago. They they try to keep the tomato to be a, a, so they they did a genetic research to have a be, the best tomato you can have in the world, but they forget the flavor. <laughs> so we have an amazing tomato without flavor, and flavor is nose, because at the end the smell of a, a tomato came from your nose. So I think that we have a lot of uh, way to to go. We have to collaborate with different disciplines. And what is the most important thing, start with the children, uh, teaching them the vocabulary of the perfumery. The perfumery and the others around they have, because they, they will recognize their own footprint in their life. Thank you. Um, if I may interject very quickly before Simon, I. I just wanted to pick up on the idea of words and vocabularies, because one of the things that Odiropa has developed, and perhaps my colleagues w want to make a, a short, a brief comment later, is that by looking at the past, we unearth a lot of vocabularies, new words that we don't use anymore, a new old words and old ways to talk about smell in different contexts. So perhaps one of the impacts that the project can have is to invite people to look at historic vocabularies and how they can be relevant today or how we can engage with them. I just wanted to pick up on that. So I think in, in my field, um, there's been this kind of focus on dedicated vocabulary for olfaction. So an analogy can be made to color, so having a term like blue or green or red that's dedicated to pick up a quality that you can't perceive using another sense. So you can't get blue through some other way. And so the idea that in English or in other European languages, a lack of this kind of categorical vocabulary for picking up a quality. What's been missing, and I think what Udaropa is de uh, delivering, is thinking about what are the expressive and symbolic capacities within the language and culture to be able to evoke and convey smell. And I think that's what's there. So I think perhaps we've been misled by focusing on just this gap, this lexical gap, and not thinking about the expressive possibilities. Um, and just kind of picking up on the idea of um, children. So um, we found if you look at um, English speaking children and their acquisition of language, adults will often uh, begin an interaction with children by pointing to something visual. So we know that you can triangulate gaze, for example, I say, look at this, you look at this, we triangulate on the same object. Um, and if you look at what caregivers to child interactions are like, often there's a, an initial turn from the caregiver that focuses visual attention, the child responds, the caregiver continues. So there's this back and forth. For smell, it's often the child that's initiating smell talk, smell this, and the caregiver shuts it down. So they say, that's yucky, put it down, change of topic. Or they'll respond once and then move on to some other action. So what we're seeing is even in interactional moments in child language acquisition, there's this kind of scaffolding of visual talk and a shutdown of olfactory talk. So you don't, I think we don't even need to necessarily do perfumery, um, although I much appreciate it, but just uh, um, uh, 
giving uh, attention to the child's interest and promoting that would be enough just to not close it down completely. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Simon. Oh, no Please. problem. No, <laughs> thanks. I've been, <clears throat> it's been great to hear everyone sort of launching into this, and the topics are fascinating. I love hearing about um, perfume pedagogies and matrices and how one learns um, that way. I also think it's something inherently kind of playful about that as well. And to return also to the topic of children, which is also interesting, I think that within cultural institutions, we actually do engage children's senses in a different way um, through smell plays, uh, exploratoria, are quite good at that. I think we're less good at engaging adult play in cultural institutions, and I think that's something we could possibly reflect upon a bit more. But um, the topic itself is fascinating, and I loved hearing about the, um, about the, uh, the caregivers and their naughty ways. <laughs> that's really interesting, thank you. So we have to start early, encouraging this so we don't lose it in children. Um, thank you for your reflections. I was wondering if we could take a couple, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience? Would anyone like a question, comment, reflection? Many of you work with smell or would like to work with smell and perhaps... Okay, I don't see any hands at the moment. Yeah, I do see hands now. Thank you, Marike. Yes, thank you for these amazing talks. I'm, I'm really fascinated by everything I hear. Um, I am a psychologist, and I, uh, or a researcher actually in psychology, and I was wondering whether the sort of special state is that uh, odors often assume to have in evoking emotional memories and emotions, whether that would be jeopardized if we start labeling odors very early on, like when, when we start training people and actually verbally describing what they're smelling, would that interfere with this sort of primitive response? So I think there's, there has been this idea um, that olfaction gains its power because of its strong connection to emotion. What language does is step away from individual episodes and to create an abstract representation and that these are somehow in conflict with one another. I'd make an analogy again to vision here. So we know that vision underserves many different functions. So we recognize forms, objects. We can recognize motion, with the what and where pathways. We have unconscious processing as well as conscious processing. Nobody says in vision, oh, you shouldn't have conscious visual processing. It'd really interfere with unconscious processing. And that's really important for organisms. I don't see any in principle reason why the brain couldn't subserve two representations for olfaction. One that's still closely linked to emotion and another then that gets um, shunted to another part of the brain that can do abstraction. That seems completely possible. And in fact, the, f the, the fact that we find languages that are able to do this kind of abstraction and it's not just a one-off, we're finding it all across the world tells me it is, it is possible. So, um, and we can train people to do it. And when we've, we haven't worked with perfumers, but we've looked at wine experts. And we can show that for wine experts, they are able to name wine odors better than coffee experts or lay people. They also remember them better. They're able to imagine them better. So you can scaffold these olfactory representations without losing the emotional evocative power. Thank you. We had a question in the third row. Is it? Yes, maybe a silly question, but I was wondering if the egg hurt because you said I wanted to test if the egg hurt and you didn't answer. <laughs> uh, yes, it hurts. <laughs> it was interesting. The first time it didn't hurt as much, but then the second time or third time it did hurt. And it, uh, the scent is quite interesting too, but I'm using, it's using commercially available um, grocery store rose water. So. Excellent. We have another question. Uh, just to build on the egg uh, conversation, so my original specialism is Renaissance sugar sculpture and that quote by Robert May that talks about throwing around the eggs to cover up the smell of powder is actually referring to gunpowder because they would have had a very animated sugar sculptures including sugar castles that fired real artillery and stag hunts that fired stags, uh, arrows at the, at the pastry stags. Okay. So the smell of a Renaissance 
banquet would have been gunpowder and rose water, or oh. some of them. <laughs> Interesting. OK. Thank you for the clarification. Great. We have a question up there. Hi, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. I feel like I'm finally with my people, that my interest in smell <laughs> isn't weird. Uh, my name is Yasmin Moll. I'm a cultural anthropologist at the University of Michigan. So I'm very interested in like lived experiences of smell and um, contestations around smell and smell as it relates to various kinds of difference. I've been hearing a lot about um, sort of heritage as past, a past to be honored, uh, sort of a legacy, how we can recreate it in the present. But also, um, I want to hear more about kind of uh, how people contest heritage through through smell and how that might relate to um, questions of race, ethnicity, uh, gender, and class in a, in a Europe that's, um, where these questions are very much alive right now. Is this question to anyone in particular? Because I'm going to direct it to Will, <laughs> who wanted to ask a question. I think it's a perfect question. Oh. I will need to engage with it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that last point about um, you know the way in which we can engage with race, class, gender, I think we've been very alive to that issue on the Odoropa project. And one of the things that we were very aware of and wanted to try and avoid is that we're using all of this digitized text to find references to smell in the past, right? And that digitized text is often written by, from a white European male colonial viewpoint. And so what we were really keen by using the digital methods to do is to unveil all of the other smells we could get from those texts that might help us kind of read against the grain and to kind of discover smells that were significant beyond the kind of white European male colonial nose. So I think that's been something that we've been really interested in. Um, and in a way, it connects to the question that I was going to ask, which is one of the things I was thinking about that what didn't really get a mention was I was wondering about how smell in all of your different fields, whether it's smell and heritage or the perfume industry or smell and play and games or in, in psychology and linguistics, to what extent the kind of work that you might do with smell might help us engage with the climate crisis and with the kind of you know imminent heat death of the world, um, you know, and whether you know we can the kinds of things that you're talking about can help play a role in raising awareness about environmental change, for example. I wonder if any of you had any thoughts on that. Uh, to add something about the gender uh, in the industry of perfumery industry today, we are going to no gender fragrances. That not unisex. Unisex was on the 90s. Today is no gender. If you like patchouli, you will use patchouli. If you like rose, you will use rose. It doesn't matter if you are man or woman, whatever you want. Then you choose your perfume for the ingredient, mostly. And also, there is a sustainable conscience today that is very important. So people are looking for ingredients that have been uh, picking up in a special way or sustainable or social way. So it's very important that we are going to the no gender fragrances. Thank you, and um, thank you, Will, for the question. I can uh, I can answer that. Yeah. There's some great games Perfect. about sustainability and 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 play and smell. If if, if you just go Google right now on your phones, uh, O Doom E A U Doom. There's a, a game that you can download and play with scents that you provide from around you and your environment. Um, great game, and uh, something you can check out for um, impact of of smell games upon issues related to climate change and sustainability. That's really interesting. I'll definitely check that out. Um, e A U O Doom D O O M E A U D O O M. It should still be coming up as your first hit. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that comment, Will, um, with regards to the um, issue of traditional crafts and actually the extent to which smell is actually a key part of that knowledge and could be more emphasised within training. I mean, there's an awful lot that we re rely on our noses in terms of, you know, understanding process and uh, understanding when things are done or 
how they're done. And so perhaps this is an area that we really are missing and should be more focused on in terms of promoting more sustainable practices and also um, providing training in those areas. So I, I've been thinking about this quite a lot, um, partly because my, my real interest, my spell interest kind of came about because of my real interest in language and languages. And as I mentioned, there's 7,000 different languages spoken um, by many uh, more traditional societies, small scale societies um, that are not, you know, as embedded in modern uh, technological society and using resources in the same way. So the Jahai uh, live in a rainforest um, in Malaysia that's uh, now under considerable pressure from logging. Um, and of course, it's not, you know, it, that affects everything. So they are very much uh, living in forests, still um, um, foraging for most of their food um, and interconnected with nature in a way that um, is really being affected by um, all of the climate emergencies that we are. And that's true for most of the communities that um, we've been working with over um, the decades. And so um, I guess two things. So one is kind of what Alison was saying earlier, that it's clear that um, being in forest or being in natural environments is um, very beneficial for mental health and well-being. So um, there's at least one study that shows Americans are spending 84% of their time indoors and 6% in a car. Um, and so, you know, you're lucky if you're spending one hour outdoors a day. And I think that's probably, I mean, le slightly less true of the Netherlands, but not far off. So we're spending our time indoors, breathing, you know, the same air, not with the windows open, um, which came up when COVID came up, how important it was to have fresh air. Uh, but we're not connecting with natural odors in the same way. So that, I, th I think, is something that we can bring into the conversation of just how important it is to... Um, be outside and to breathe odors from natural environments. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to pick up on that as well. And I think certainly from, um, as I was saying, I think the, the, the key to, to uh, how do you say, gaining wider adoption is connecting this to these bigger issues, sustainability, well-being. And it's really interesting when you look, for example, in health, the emphasis now on diet and variety of diet. I think it's probably the same goes for smell. We, 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 we're li existing in very, very limited smellscapes. And um, I think that probably this is uh, in your area, this is a wide area of research as to what mental effects this is having on us um, in, in just not being exposed to enough variety. Um, of, of sense. I, I was wondering if you could say something about that. We're very short on time. Or anyone in the audience. Just, just a quick reaction. And then well, we, I, I've started thinking about this in terms of um, uh, the associations between the senses and natural landscapes. And one project we've looked at comparing English, German and French speakers and how strongly they associate smell with different water features. So very strongly with the sea, for example, but not so strongly with canal. Actually, we found maybe that'll change with Bernardo's project. No, no. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's not just pleasant, but like um, bogs, for example, can have an, a strong olfactory association, but an unpleasant one. So I think this is something that is there latently, but not really brought forward into consciousness. And I think that's something that we can definitely engage with more just to bring that to the, to the front. Thank you. And I, I will just add that as part of the project, we have our colleague Victoria Michelle also doing her PhD exploring smellscapes and developing methods to engage and record the knowledge that um, is acquired via, via no-sled walks. So I think also methodological development for natural smellscapes or man-made smellscapes is also really important and perhaps one of the legacies of the project as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Marik is going to stand up and kick us out of the <laughs> chairs. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Hey, that was
was really great. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Obviously, we're only just getting started. So um, uh, I want to uh, refer you to your printed program if you have one for what happens next. So after a brief coffee break, um, which we'll have just uh, outside the door here, we welcome you to join your breakout session, um, which is uh, listed on the card that came with your name tag. Uh, if you received a card and received an, um, uh, with your breakout room, then you've claimed your seat in that breakout room. If not, then um, please, uh, if you have not received a card, then you have not chosen a breakout room yet, and you can refer to your program to choose one. Um, it's listed which breakout room, it's listed um, what will happen there and where it will be. Um, just please be considerate that many of these rooms are quite full, so if there isn't space, um, please go to your uh, second choice. Um, there will also be team members standing at the doors to help you with this process, so if you have any questions, you can ask them um, where your breakout room is. There's also signs uh, throughout the building. Uh, after your breakout room, uh, the first breakout room session, we'll have um, lunch in the foyer at 1245 to recharge for the second breakout room session, um, which will conclude at 3 o'clock. Um, and then after all the breakout room sessions are over, then we're excited to kick off the Smell Fair in the afternoon, where 12 uh, diverse industry and business representatives will exhibit their work, and we'll also have 10 olfactory-related researchers who will participate in a poster session. And then we'll, we welcome all of you to join us at the reception starting at 5.30 to raise a glass with us on the conclusion of the Odoropa project and to look forward to the future. Uh, and lastly, um, it is now with pleasure that I uh, kick off the fair and a big thank you to the Odoropa team members who worked very hard to organize um, the workshops today and to give you a very wonderful and engaging experience. And so I welcome you to have fun, uh, meet like-minded people, and most importantly, follow your nose. So enjoy. Thank you.